The story of Ted Bundy, the very definitions of heartless evil. Ted Bundy described himself as the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. His crimes certainly prove that statement true. During the spring and summer of 1974, police in the Pacific Northwest were in a panic. Young women at colleges across Washington and Oregon were disappearing at an alarming rate and law enforcement had few leads as to who was behind it. In just six months, six women had been abducted. Panic in the area reached a fuel pitch when Janice and Dennis disappeared in broad daylight from a crowded beach at Lake Sammamish State Park. But the boldness of the abductions also yielded the first real break in the case. On the day Ott and Naslin vanished, several other women remembered being approached by a man who had tried and failed to lure them to his car. They told the authorities about an attractive young man with his arm in a sling. His vehicle was a brown Volkswagen Beetle and the name he gave them was Ted. After releasing this description to the public, the police were contacted by four people who identified the same Seattle resident, Ted Bundy. These four people included Ted Bundy's ex-girlfriend, a close friend of his, one of his co-workers and a psychology professor who had taught Bundy. But the police were inundated with tips and they dismissed Ted Bundy as a suspect, thinking it unlikely that a clean-cut law student with no other criminal record could be the perpetrator. He didn't fit the profile. These types of judgments benefited Ted Bundy many times throughout his murderous career as one of the history's most infamous serial killers, which saw him take at least 60 victims across seven states in the 1970s. For a time, he fooled everyone. The cops who didn't suspect him, the prison guards whose facilities he escaped from, the women he manipulated, the wife who married him after he was caught. But he was, as his final lawyer said, the very definition of heartless evil. As Ted Bundy himself once remarked, I am the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. Ted Bundy was born in Vermont across the country from the Pacific Northwest communities he would one day terrorize. His mother was Elena Lewitt Covell and his father was unknown. His grandparents, ashamed of their daughter's out-of-wedlock pregnancy, raised him as their own child. For nearly all of his childhood, he believed his mother to be his sister. His grandfather would regularly beat both Ted and his mother, causing her to run away with her son to live with cousins in Tacoma, Washington, when Bundy was five years old. There, Eleanor met and married hospital cook Johnny Bundy, who formally adopted the young Ted Bundy and gave him his last name. Bundy dis disliked his stepfather and would rather later describe him to a girlfriend despairingly, saying he wasn't very bright and didn't make much money. Little else is known for sure about the remainder of Bundy's childhood, as he gave conflicting accounts of his earlier years to different biographers. In general, he described an ordinary life punctuated by dark fantasies that affected him powerfully though the degree to which he acted on them remains unclear. Ted Bundy's first known attack was not an actual murder, but instead an assault on 18-year-old Karen Sparks, a student and dancer at the University of Washington. Bundy broke into her apartment and blanched her unconsciousness with a metal drawer from a bed frame before sexually assaulting her with the same object. 
His assault left her in a 10-day coma and with permanent disabilities. Ted Bundy's next victim and his first confirmed murder was Linda Ann Healy, another University of Washington student. A month after his assault on Karen Sparks, Bundy broke into Healy's apartment in the early morning, knocked her unconsciousness, then clothed her body and carried her out to his car. She was never seen again, but part of her skull was discovered years later at one of the locations where Bundy dumped his bodies. Afterward, Bundy continued targeting female students in the area. He developed a technique. Approaching women while wearing a cast or appearing otherwise disabled and asking them to help him put his something in his car. He would then bulge in them unconscious before binding, raping and killing them, dumping their bodies in a remote location in the woods. Bunty would often revisit their sites to have sex with their decaying corpses. In some cases, Bunty would decapitate his victims and keep your skulls in his apartment sleeping beside his trophies. The ultimate possession was, in fact, the taking of the life. Bundy once said, and then the physical possession of the remains. Murder is not just a crime of lust or violence, he has explained. It becomes possession. They are part of you. Because a part of you and you are for a forever one and the grounds where you kill them or leave them become sacred to you and you will always be drawn back to them. Over the next five months, Bundy abducted and murdered five female college students in the Pacific Northwest. Donna Gail Manson, Susan Ellen, Roberta Kathleen, Brenda Carroll and Georgian Hawkins. Responding to this rash of disappearances, police called for a major investigation and enlisted a number of different government agencies to help look for the missing girls. Unaware of law enforcement's growing interest in him, Bunty continued killing, journeying to Colorado from his home in Utah to murder more young women there. Finally, in August 1975, Bundy was pulled over while driving through a Salt Lake City suburb and police discovered masks, handcuffs and blunt objects in the car. While this was not enough to arrest him, a police officer realizing that Bundy was also a suspect in the earlier killings put him under surveillance. The officers then found his beetle, which he had since sold, where they discovered hair matching three of his victims. But this evidence they put him in a lineup, where he was identified by one of the women whom he had attempted to abduct. He was convicted of kidnapping and assault and sent to prison while police attempted to build a murder case against him. But arrest didn't stop Ted Bundy from killing. He was soon able to, for the first of two times in his life, escape from custody. Bundy was finally executed by electric chair on January 24, 1989. Hundreds of people gathered outside the courthouse to celebrate his death. For everything he did to the girls, the Belgian, the strangulation, the humiliating the bodies, torturing them. I feel that the electric chair is too good for him," said Eleanor Rose, the mother of victim Dennis Nuslin. Though he confessed to many murders before his death, the true number of Bundy's victims remains unknown. Bundy denied certain killings despite physical evidence tying him to the crimes and allude to others that were never substantiated. Ultimately, all this has led authorities to suspect Bunty killed anyway from 30 to 40 women, making him one of the most infamous and terrifying serial killers in American history and perhaps the very definition of heartless evil.